Okay, I'm just going to start by um, shredding, because <laughs> I like doing it. So I'm just going to put a backing track on, I'm going to just play, see what happens. You guys need to bear with me because I haven't touched a guitar today <laughs> apart from just now, so I need to warm into it. So I'm just going to stick a backing track on and play, and then I'll take some questions. Anybody who's got any questions about the playing or whatever you'd like to ask, then we'll, we'll do that. How does that sound? <laughs> yeah. Cool. So I'm just going to take a... Um, Static backing track, which I tend to do a lot. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys do play over static backing tracks. They're really good. They're challenging because um, you've got to be really, really creative with the way that you think and how you phrase and your note <coughs> choice and everything else. So for me, they're really, really challenging. And in some cases, a lot more challenging than having like set chords, like a set progression or something. So that's what I'm going to start with. Um, what I'm going to try and do is build what I play um, based on any ideas that I stumble across. Um, what I'm talking about here is like motivic development, whether that's rhythm or melody. Um, so keep your eyes, or I should say ears peeled out for any of, any of that kind of thing. But I'm just going to slam it on and play. Let's do it. If any of you know my YouTube channel, you might recognise this backing track. It's one of my favourites. In the e Dorian. Let's get the levels right first.
Okie dokie, any questions about what I played or any thoughts or... I was wondering, Sorry. you... Is that... <laughs> <laughs> you, you're doing a mixed sweet picking and a hybrid picking. Mm. Why do you favour hybrid picking when you could just sweep it? Uh, well, hybrid for me, it opens up a lot of doors for me. For one, I, I really like the sound of and the feel of actually using my fingers to play. Um, it's a lot easier for me to use hybrid picking because um, I'm actually a trained classical guitar player as well. So I've always had my nails at a certain length, and for me, it just feels a lot more comfortable. Um, but it enables me to play stuff that I wouldn't be able to normally play because I can make a big jump across strings, you know. Say if I want to go, if I want to play a bottom E to a top E, any of the techniques is going to be really challenging for me to do that. You know, even though it's you know, still doable, it's so much easier. Uh, but, and I also really like the tone that you get with it. Depends what, what guitar I'm using. This is more... Uh, with this guitar, it's more of a rock guitar. With that, I, I tend to use hybrid a lot more, purely because of the tone that you get. But that's one of the reasons why I use it. It's just part of, part of my technique now, is what I tend to just do by default, really. Um, I, f I think it would be pretty impossible to do any sweeping with, with hybrid technique, purely just because of the nature of the, the technique of sweeping. So. I kind of, I still do a lot of sweeping, but I just use conventional technique for that. You know, the economy of mo movement across the strings. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I was just curious, because quite often if you're doing a hybrid, you might do, um, you do pick, and then you do pick again, and I just always think... Um, Depends you know, what I'm doing. Depends it might what be I'm just doing. as easy to sweep it, so I was wondering if there's kind of a logic there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it depends what I'm doing. My, a lot of the, the stuff that I, I've... I play is based around um, certain techniques. Um, it's not just based around the, those techniques, but um, there's just to give you an example. This, um, if I want to play, this is how how I approach with hybrid. If I want to play um, that kind of line, I would actually hybrid that. It's so much easier to do than sweeping it, for me anyway. Somebody else who's, who's a really good sweeper might decide to do it that way, but that's just one example of the kind of thing I use with hybrid picking. Is, it, is that a technique you use a lot? Hybrid? I'm just starting to get into it. Um, I'm more of a sweep picking guy, but right. um, when I'm against the metronome, I struggle to keep the sweeping in time. And uh, so I'm a big for me, fan of Brett Garson and all those yeah. guys and trying to get my head around how they do it. So, a lot of the time, if you, if you watch guys like Brett Garcia, those, will, um, those guys will tell you as well that the, the technique is, part of it's for the feel, but part of it's to be able to jump strings without the big physical exertion of moving the, the right hand from one string to another. Because it's pretty challenging. You know, if you're going... <laughs> so much sense to do rather than moving the pick. That for me is more of a challenge. But, you know that kind of thing is so much easier. I also use it for the faster lines like that. really good way of crossing strings. Good question actually because it's opened up a whole lot of things. Um, I use hybrid, it's a big part of my technique for, for crossing strings as well when I go from one string to the next because the majority of players I think the problems occur when you go from one string to the next. It certainly does for me. Um, you know if guitar was just a one string instrument there'd be no problems you wouldn't have to worry about moving the pick anywhere other than that on that string but because we've got to move the right hand in that direction as well we've got to deal with string crossing and that's where for most players the the technique really um, has to be under control and that's where a lot of problems develop because of that 
Um, so with my the, the way I practice now is is really to try and zone in on that aspect of playing when you go from one string to the next. Um, <coughs> Especially when you're playing lead stuff, I presume you're all lead players. Yeah? <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Try. Uh, <laughs> <end to me. laughs> uh, that's great. I mean, if you can go straight to um, that issue of, of crossing strings when you play, you'll be saving a whole bunch of time because that, over the years that I've been playing, I've been playing for over 20 years now, I've realised that is the biggest stumbling block for a lot of players. Yeah, the technique itself needs specific work like anything else, but it's when you go from string to string that, that causes the main problem uh, for most players. Um, so I kind of boiled it down to, to, to base, three basic movements when you, when you do it. You might, might have come across this, um, and that is inside movement and outside movement. This is to do with when you cross strings, when you go from one to the next. Um, anybody come across that before? you come across that? I think it was in one of your... Yeah. Yeah. Your it's... Um, from your PDFs. Yeah. I, I call it um, inside movement and outside movement. I'll explain exactly what I mean. Um, stop me if you don't understand it, by the way. You know, be, feel free to stop me. Don't feel embarrassed or anything. Say, I don't understand what you're saying. Say it again. Um, basically, with the pick, whenever we cross strings, we can do it one of three main ways. We can either... <coughs> Um, go outside of the two strings that we're playing. So, for example, let's take the bottom E string. Can you see all right there? Uh, let's go from the bottom E string to the A string. Uh, you can do it either by playing a down stroke and an up stroke. So, if you all do that, can you just do that for me? A down and an up. Can you see that the pick is travelling outside of the two strings? Like this. If you look at the strings, the pick is going outside of those two. That's it. Yeah. The other option is to do the opposite, up to down. If you look at the movement of the pick, the pick is travelling inside the strings. For most guys, that is the awkward one, the inside picking. Mm -hmm. you know, it's the one that most guys have to work on. Because it just, for one, it feels very unnatural. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody know why it feels unnatural? If you look at it logically, why do you think it would feel unnatural to do that movement? Is it it is on, the, on an upstroke. On up well, that's one reason. What did you say? Don't come back on yourself. Exactly, exactly. If you're, if you're going from up to down, if you look at the right hand movement, if I slow it down, when you do an upstroke, as you exactly quite rightly said, when you do an upstroke, the right hand is travelling in the, in the wrong direction for the string we want it to, to be at. So if we do an upstroke, bang, we've got to then stop the right hand in the direction that's travelling, change direction, then find the string. If you look at the, the outside movement, if we do a downstroke, the pick is going in that direction anyway. So for most people, the outside movement is the natural movement. Ideally, you want both techniques down as well as, as, well as um, you need to be able to play them both with the same level of control. I'll come to the other one in a minute. So I'll show you an example of what I do to practice this. Uh, I'll take, say, the top two strings, the B and the E, and I'll do this shape. That's it. But what I'll do is I'll practice it by going, doing four outside movements, then four inside movements. <laughs> that's it, that's great. That's good. Be careful of that right hand though, just keep it a bit slower. Yeah, put it a bit slower. That's it, just be careful when you yeah. change it. It's the weirdest noise ever. It's like a sort of minimalistic <laughs> piece of music, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> Steve Wright. Violin <laughs> tuner. <laughs> So the key is, one interesting thing when I'm watching you guys do this, and this is really, really something that I realised was so, so important. Every, pretty much every single one of you guys was sat here going like this. Looking around. That's the big, for me, that's the biggest no-no that you can do. 
if you're not look, looking at your right hand, your right hand can start to do all sorts of things that you don't want it to. The right hand is like kids. If you don't keep them under control, they'll be off doing things that you really don't want them to be doing. So you have to control this right hand, and the way that you do it, or a big portion of what is going to make the difference with your technique is by making sure your eyes are trained on your right hand. Because that way, you can see if your right hand is making the correct movement or not. If you're like this, how do you know? How do you know that you're not, you haven't got the movement right? So for me, keep your eyes peeled on your right hand at all times when you're doing that movement. You know, really, really important. Uh, so now what I'm, I'll go back to what I was showing you, you guys, uh, the, that movement again. What I want you to do is to do it again, but the way that I practice this is not about speed or anything like that. It's about controlling the sound of each note. Each note has got to sound exactly the same. So what I do is I practice doing, um, it's usually best to do it with less gain, but I'm not going to change guitars just yet. Um, what you want to do is be able to play that, change to it from outside to inside picking without any audible difference. You shouldn't be able to hear the change in attack. So you should be able to do that at any given moment. Can you try that guys? See how that feels. Keep your eyes peeled on your right hand as well. Are you doing um, economy picking to when you do the change? The economy picking to yeah. Pick let me ex I'll explain that. Good point. You. There. When you do one, two, three, four on your last upstroke, the way that you have to do it is you have to do two upstrokes in a row. Any alternate picking guys here main, that are mainly alternate. Yeah. yeah. This is probably a big challenge. I don't know how you feel about. It. Can you do both economy yeah. and? Oh well, that's great. Not many guys can. All the guys that I've met are either alternate or economy. There are there are some freaks out there that can do both <laughs> really, really well. But the majority of guys yeah, are either in one camp yeah. or the next. Um, but with this, what you've got to do is you've got to, as, as you exactly said, do two upstrokes. Um, that leads me on to another thing with picking as well uh, that I'll talk about in a minute. But. So, yeah, absolutely right. When you change two upstrokes in a row, and that's going to be the thing that's going to really throw you if you don't get it down. So, anyway, that's a little bit on um, crossing strings. One way that you can cross strings that I haven't talked about is um, hybrid picking. There is another way, which is, but it's included in that, in that which is um, economy picking, going to the next string with the same stroke. Actually, before we do the hybrid one, can you do that? Just two down strokes. Again, that beautiful sound. Good. It's interesting looking at some guys here as well. Some of you guys are separating the strokes when you do down strokes, like this. Yeah. Like that. Some of you guys are doing this. Do you know what, what's the difference there? Sweeping. It's economy of movement, economy of motion, which is basically sweeping is one element of economy of movement. Um, for me, myself as a player, I'm, I'm all about economy of motion, economy of movement. And that's what my technique is based on. Um, and for me, it's all about being logical with your, your <coughs> technique. If, you're do, if you've got two strokes to make, makes sense to me to do the minimum movement possible. Why? Because it's efficient and also because it's easier, it makes life a lot easier and guitar playing is hard enough, you know, so I want to make things as easy as possible. Having said that, it's bloody hard to do. <laughs> so um, it's a good thing to sort of approach your um, thinking about this in terms of 
Am I using too much movement with the right hand? You know, if I am, how can I minimise it? There are ways to do that, which we'll talk about in a bit. Anyway, the other, the third part is this is a long answer to your question. Um, <laughs> the, the third, the third one is, is hybrid picking, which is down and then either middle finger or ring finger, usually middle finger. So. So it's good. Really useful technique this, because you're eliminating excess movement. When I'm doing this, my right hand doesn't move. As opposed to that, look at the movement in the right hand here. Uh, as opposed to that. It makes all that kind of stuff really easy. So... I use that kind of thing all the time. Um, so um, I use it when I'm crossing strings. So that, to, to answer your question about the hybrid picking, it's a massive part of my playing purely because I use it for the feel but I also use it because it's economical with the movement and I can play pretty fast lines just by dealing with that string cross by doing either a, a downstroke and a middle <coughs> finger or an upstroke and a middle finger. So, so if you were playing like three notes per string, you go down, up, down, finger, down. Um, It depends because I generally wouldn't use hybrid picking if I was doing linear, oh, okay. linear lines. Yeah. You know, if I was doing a scale... <laughs> It, that would be economy. Because it's just so much easier for me to do that. It just feels a lot more natural. But I tend, I'll only do, nowadays I do it as a little bit of tension within a solo or something. Yeah. So I'll, I try not to do lines like that, that are just rapid fire picking all the time, because it gets a bit boring if you, if you hear it all the time. And the, I think it has more impact if you just do a little burst of it and then you're back into you know tasty phrasing and all that. Yeah, so but in terms of that, I still do practice going. Playing scales with index and middle. So I might actually can I just change this guitar over? Just while I'm demonstrating this. Slightly different tone on this. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I do practice with playing scales with a mixture of um, picks and middle finger. So, it's worth doing. Any of you guys tried it? It's worth, worth experimenting with just for the sound that you get with it. A lot of the time I'll just do, I'll do stuff like, instead of playing a G major three note string like this, that kind of thing, what I'll do is play down, middle, then hammer on. You get a different, different kind of sound. That's just one example anyway. Um, Um, the, the, probably one of the, the um, there's lots of different ways that you can do it, but I'll show you one of the ways that I did it. Um, and generally, you're better off with hybrid picking. You're better off trying to incorporate it in your playing by just using starting out using one finger, because um, there are things that you can practice just like playing a regular chord. <laughs> like that but it's a bit challenging so what I want you guys to do is do this hold uh, an E minor chord that's it you know what's coming <laughs> is it the yeah, yeah absolutely 
Because I studied classical guitar, I basically took um, a classical guitar piece, piece, just the start of the piece, and applied hybrid picking to it. So, we all got our E minor chord. What we're going to do is we're going to use the pick and the middle finger. And we're going to play alternating strings. So, I'm going to tell you which strings we're going to play. So, the lower string I want to play with a pick, a downstroke, and the higher string play with the middle finger. So, we're going to go 6 4. So, string 6 and 4. Like this. God, this is horrendous. <laughs> We've got our E chord, it's six strings, six and four. Got that? Down, middle. So I'll just say down hybrid. Then we go five, three. That's it. <coughs> and then four, two. And then three, one. We're just going to just do that portion of the, the arpeggio. Oh, sounds like people are shredding it. That's it. That's it. That's good. Good. How does that feel for you guys to do that? Comfortable? Yeah? I'm just going to show you a little trick to help your technique. Um, with hybrid picking. One of the best things that you can do with hybrid picking, and this actually applies to picking, which I'll probably touch on in a bit, is um, a technique called planting technique. Again, I pinched this from the classical guitar fraternity. It made sense, nobody else was doing it. I saw it and thought, wow, that's, that's amazing. So I use it in my electric plane all the time now. And it's called planting technique. And basically, we plant either the pick or the fingers on the strings ready to play the string. The beauty of that is what you're doing is you're training your hand to go to where it needs to be in advance before you play. The pros of that are basically it's virtually impossible to miss the string because if your hands are in contact with the string already, how can you miss it? You can, believe me, you can. I've seen people do it. But, the idea behind it is that 99.9% .9 of the time, because you're in contact with the string, you can't miss the string. So, what I want you to do is the first two notes again, but what I want you to do is place the pick and the finger on both strings. Play the pick and then play the finger. That's it. Good. That's it. Make sure you're looking at your right hand still, so I can see a lot of heads up. And Get the middle, both the middle finger and the pick on the string. That's good. That's great. So that's just one example, you can, you can change the chords around. Um, the whole tune, is, the, the pattern is this. Um, yeah, the, the, the piece goes through various different chords. Um, and the whole pattern with the E minor chord is this. It's really easy to do when you plant the fingers on the strings. It enables you to control the tone more as well, I find, if your fingers are already on the strings. So, planting technique for me is one of the most important things that I discovered as a guitar player. 
because it helped me to train my right hand to make the minimum movement. One of the things that I get asked a lot is how come your fingers don't look as though you're moving or you know you don't seem to be doing anything. Um, a lot of that is a byproduct of you know working at economy of motion and this planting technique is a big big part of that. So if you want to control the amount of movement that you do with both your right and your left hands, well it's mainly the right, <coughs> you need to be looking at techniques like this because they're really really going to help you get rid of all the stuff that you don't need. You know, like excess movement. That's just an issue that, that will get in the way of your playing. If you can eliminate that, it's going to make everything a lot easier. Everything. <coughs> doesn't matter what you're playing. doesn't matter what style you're playing, what type of music, what technique, anything. It's just, it's going to help. So, yeah, that's another, another long answer to that question. Any, any other questions you want to ask? Anything about the techniques and stuff? Yeah, um, interesting to say, like classical guitar was sort of where you started out. That's where I started out, but I almost really? like drew a line and then went electric. And then sort of, if I pick up a classical, I play classical, pick up electric. I'm interested to know what other techniques you you maybe have applied. What, from classical? Yeah, something. Um, well, there's nothing that's as no, obvious as that one. <laughs> no, no, not really. It's mainly been those. Um, I did... I've learned classical pieces as uh, you know arrangements, so I did one piece. Um, I probably can't play it now, so I, whenever I learn something, I learn it and then don't play it for for ages. But it's a Bach piece that's. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, I won't go, I won't carry on, but I did a lot of that, which is if you notice, it's hybrid picking as well. Mm. Um, in terms of techniques, very little, because I've realised that with my playing with hybrid picking, I only really need the pick and the middle finger, especially when I'm playing lead stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't really need anything else. There are, sometimes I'll play arpeggios with, that are rolled, mm -hmm. you know, a bit like Brett Garcet does it, although he does it, but it includes his little finger. There's no way I could do that, it's just not strong enough. Um, but I do it slightly differently. I do an extra pick stroke if I want to do those kind of things. But in terms of classical guitar, no, those are really the only things from that. I spent quite a few years studying classical guitar to, to not actually <laughs> have it in my life that much anymore. <laughs> uh, at the time, I devoted all my time to it. I actually stopped playing electric for quite some time um, because I was so focused on becoming, you know, this classical guitar performer. And it just... Well, for one, I realised I didn't really, I didn't love it as much as I do electric, and I just came back to this, and it was like, yeah, man, this is <laughs> this is home for me, you know. Yeah. So instead of it being wasted, what I did was learn a lot of or transcribe a lot of classical stuff. I love Bach, mm -hmm. so transcribed a lot of his stuff for for electric guitar, uh, most of which hasn't seen the light of day at all. Just one or two pieces. So maybe I should do get more of that in the transcriptions out there. I think. But that side of it, and what I learned about approach to practice, and you know, intelligent practice, and understanding posture, and you know, it's why when I people ask me simple questions, I tend to just go off, and you know, because it's it's so involved. Well, the way I look at it is, there's a lot of things to it. Mm -hmm. You so know, how has it influenced your posture then, your approach to actually oh, playing? Oh, everything. One of the biggest things that that happened to me was when I learned I was studying this guy. Uh, concert guitarist actually, really good player, you know, been playing for years and performed everywhere. And when I first took lessons from him, I turned up for the first lesson and uh, he said, right, you're not going to need the guitar. <laughs> he said, the way you're sitting is all wrong, so put the guitar down. So we, he got me, you know, getting the posture right purely so that you, you could, it was all about equilibrium, everything has to be balanced and you've got to be able to breathe, you've got to be conscious of all the movements of you know your muscles and tension and everything else so you've got to be you've got to be in that position which is kind of you know conducive to, to positivity you know regarding that anyway basically he said right for the next week I just want you to practice sitting <laughs> I was like what, what is this you know you take can you, show, can you show everybody now if you can condense it obviously it's, if it's a long lesson but I mean I mean, it's I don't want to kind of go off on a long one a lesson. Yeah, sitting, well, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great actually. That, the rest of this workshop is going to be sitting. So, <laughs> no, but go. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> get lost. Um, I usually left knee as well, you know. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, to, to me, for what the way I'll explain it is, to, is relating it to electric guitar because classical guitar posture is all about you know using the footstool and everything else and having the guitar in a certain position. We don't have to do that with electric. You know, the majority of players, electric players, do sit like that. I, that, I'm not comfortable with that. Um, for one, I can't get the stretches that I would normally get. For two, if I stand up, that's, that isn't my playing position if I'm playing live. That's my playing position if I'm, if I'm playing live. And it is for most guys when they've got a strap on. <laughs> when they've got a... When they're wearing a strap on. <laughs> You're going to edit that out. <laughs> so, where was I? Um, so, when, when I sit, I need the guitar to be in exactly the same position as when I stand. So, if I sit like, like that and I stand... <coughs> So that's how I've kind of developed my sitting position. Um, but there's nothing wrong with sit if you're comfortable playing like that, absolutely nothing wrong with it. Which is why I'm saying the, the answer to this, if rather than go down the that route, the classical guitar is a really different approach. That's one thing I learned with, with electric guitar. <coughs> the most important thing with this is with your posture, you need to be aware of how you're sitting and whether you're if the way that you're sitting is creating any excess tension which could affect your playing negatively. You know, a lot of players will, will do this and hunch over. I tend to do it sometimes actually, but um, and sit in positions which just are really uncomfortable, you know. So it's a good idea to go right back and just sit with the guitar and say to yourself, right, have I got a really comfortable playing position? Because a lot of times people will play stuff, struggle with it, and then just put the guitar down and blame themselves for not being good enough. And usually there's an answer to, to all problems, there's a solution to all problems. Um, so in terms of posture, assess how you sit. You know, just sit and see if, see if you can feel any tension. It's a good, good thing to just, you know, breathe a few times, just concentrate on the way you're sitting and just try and feel whether there's any excess tension, you know. So that's what I do all the time and it, it helps my playing immensely. So really good question that, John, and really, really important question as well. So I think something else that you've mentioned, you mentioned the posture, you also mentioned practice, yeah. the intelligent practice and the way that, I suppose you were taught to practice. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah. Um, one element of playing guitar is knowing how to practice properly. This is where a lot of players waste years and years and years of their playing time because they don't practice correctly. Or don't, Correctly is the wrong term, they don't practice efficiently. Um, I'm doing this video, I'm doing a DVD on th uh, Friday, and it's a Learn to Play Eric Johnson DVD. And um, luckily, <laughs> I had to book into this, to film this um, with very little, you know, short notice, so I've had to learn these tunes really, really quickly. But luckily, because of the way that I practice, I'm able to learn things very, very quickly. And the way, that you, the way that I do it is by going straight to the problem areas within whatever, whatever it is that you're practicing. Sounds like common sense, it is common sense, but most guys don't do it correctly. Playing guitar is all about muscle memory, it really is. It sounds like a trivial way of approaching it, but it, it really is about muscle memory. Um, and if you want to be good at something, you've got to practice very efficiently and very intelligently. So let's say you've got a little phrase um, that you're playing, whatever it is, and you're, you, you can't seem to get it. <laughs> you can't seem to get this phrase or pattern or whatever it is. How would you, how would you approach it? What would you do? Slow it down. Yeah. That's the first thing. That's the first thing slow it right down. The speed is always an indicator of where you are at level wise with a particular technique, whether it's a lick, a peggio, whatever it is, a riff, whatever. You've got to use that tempo as an indicator of where you are with it. A lot of players will, are too impetuous, they'll just push the tempo up because it's normal. Everybody wants to be good quickly. Everyone wants to learn something quickly. But if you do that, it's going to take you twice, if not ten times as long to learn it and get it under control. What I've always done is I've gone, 
If I say I'm learning, like, I'm learning Cliffs of Dover, Eric Johnson. Any, any you guys play it? Not, it, it not, as quick, not as quick as he does. It's really hard. It's ridiculous. It is. Um, when I actually sat, I thought, yeah, I should, should fly through this. Sat down and I was like, no, this is going to happen. <laughs> so, just to give you an example of that, what I had to do was I had to um, sit down, go through the peak, learn the parts really slowly, I mean painfully slowly, <coughs> but find out where the problem areas were. And the way that I, I find the problem areas is not by speeding it up and ballsing it up. I go by how it feels to me if I'm clear up here in my mind. If it's not clear in my mind or I'm thinking, no, I just don't feel quite right, I know that's going to be a problem area. So what I do is I go straight to that area and go, why is it a problem for me? Is it the fingering? You know, is it the right hand? Is it, am I losing my posture here? So I start to think about all these basic things, which are basic, but every guitarist forgets to do when it comes to practice. You know? So um, that's how, for me personally, by doing this, I'm able to learn something really, really quickly. Because I can identify the problem area, <coughs> go straight to it and solve it by practicing it in a really efficient way. The way that I build up the speed is I will not take that tempo up until my mind or my everything feels like it, it I'm in control of it. You know, because then I know when I take it up a notch, I'm not gonna mess it up. Because every time you mess it up, you're practicing mistakes. You are. You know. There's there's a part in it that I mean the main riff is is this. <laughs> ages because I didn't feel that out of all the parts that were in it the faster parts just came quite naturally but the slower parts because of the timing and the, 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 the feel of the rhythm the time feel I, that needed real solid practice on it so the idea is that you're able to problem solve when you're practicing do any of you guys feel that, that um, you come hit a brick wall when you practice and you, you, you get pissed off and you yeah. You don't feel that you're improving as quickly as you should. As you should. I think uh, a lot of it's discipline as well, and I think uh, I'm, I'm guilty of it. I'm sure we all at some point as well. Is you tend to start playing a riff or practicing something, and it sounds like something else, and you lead off onto something else, <laughs> and you just you lose yeah. focus on what you're actually trying to do. That's interesting. That mm -hmm. I think lots of people do it in different ways. Uh, when I first started, I used to think that I could do things straight away, okay. you know. And a lot of the time, strangely, when I first learned it, I was like, yeah, I can play it. But then it would fall to pieces because, you know, I, I wasn't really aware of it. I hadn't listened to how it felt, you know, to, to, to get it right. So I'd ignore it, keep playing it, and just keep practicing mistakes and setting myself up for, for future problems. Um, but it's normal. Everybody wants to do it straight away, you know, and it's, like you say, discipline. Mm. One of the most important things, not just in guitar playing, in life. It really is. And a lot of it's to do with up here. If you can control what's going on up here, you stand a lot more chance of controlling everything else around you, you know. Uh, just, I don't know if you guys know, but I used to be really fat. <laughs> really big. Um, uh, only as a um, short time ago was May last year and uh, from what I learned with guitar and approach and discipline and everything else I sorted this out up here and completely changed everything and now my life is completely different anyway I don't want to go down that route that's, a, that's you know for Weight Watchers or something like that so, um, but interesting point about discipline um, a lot of people can talk the talk, but they can't put it into action, you know what I mean? Yeah. The way to do that is to be honest with yourself. You know, when you're sitting down just and you find yourself noodling, you've got to say to yourself, hang on, stop it. What am I doing? I'm wasting time, you know? Um, you've got to use time efficiently and you've got to, it's a, you really have to be honest with yourself and say to yourself, am I doing the most efficient practice here, you know? And sometimes it's painful because most people don't, they can't handle honesty, you know, and especially when from themselves, the hardest thing to do is tell yourself that you're not doing it properly, 
because you don't want to hear that, do you? <laughs> so you ignore it and you carry on just doing everything the way that you've done it before. Um, the best thing you can do is be honest with yourself and say, no, 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 it's not working, is it? You know, let's take a look at it. Um, and that, that's what I want you to take away from today. I want you to go away thinking, <coughs> okay, uh, let's try what he talked about. And I'm talking about simple things, like when you're trying to learn a lick, or whatever it is, reassess how you approach it. Are you doing everything correctly? Are you sitting correctly? Are you breathing properly? How is your right hand moving? Have you got control of the right hand? You know, Whenever I play anything, I need to know what's happening 100% of the time. With, especially with the right hand, because that's usually where it falls apart. So everything's got to be... <coughs> what I'm trying to say is everything falls back to, to up here. You've got to be clear up here. If you're clear about what you're meant to do up here, these will have no problem. If there's something not clear, that signal is going to be, that mixed signal is going to go to your fingers and they'll be like, hang on, you're telling me, you, you're telling me one thing and you know, it doesn't make any sense. And the fingers won't do it. That's why most people, when they try stuff, they're like, oh, bloody hell. <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not the fingers' fault. You're not sending the right signal to the fingers. You know, so take a step back, think about it before you do it. And, you know, you'll, you will see a lot more results that way. Sometimes, well, quite often, uh, I'll, I'll be attempting something uh, and I'll go at it and I'll go at it and I'll go at it. And when the frustration starts to set in, I'll leave it alone and I'll just go off yeah. doing something else. Because when I've said and done, you play it for pleasure. Yeah. Um, and then I come back to it. Is there anything wrong with that approach? Nothing. No, absolutely. That's one of the best things that you can do. Um, it's, I see it like, a, like resting, it's a rest period. Resting is just as important as working out or practicing or anything else or any physical exertion that you do or mental exertion for that fact, for that matter. The rest period, get, having a break from it, is just as important as the work that you do because that's where all that information that you've um, worked on will be assimilated and it, the magic happens during that rest period, not while you're playing. It's yeah. during that rest period. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to be able to, to say to yourself, hang on, it's not working, let me, you know. Or, you know, just have plenty of breaks. That's mm -hmm. really important. But just taking breaks isn't the, answer, isn't the answer to being a better player. That's just one small part of the bigger picture, you know. It's about when you spend, if you've got half an hour's practice to do, make it the best practice that you've ever done the most useful, constructive practice, you know? Not half an hour of attempting to do something and failing, you know, because that's what most people do. And the reason I'm saying this is because I've, I've done it. I've been in that boat, you know? Um, and I still, after 20 odd years of playing, have to remind myself, you know, because it's, for some reason, it's in human nature to just mess around and <laughs> not concentrate, you know? <laughs> So everybody, you know, don't think that you're the only person, everybody's in the same boat, but it's about being sensible when you practice and just say to yourself, right, I'm going to do this properly. Half an hour, 30 minutes, nothing, absolutely nothing. But if you do 30 minutes of solid, constructive, intelligent practice, you will be that much further up that ladder of progress, so to speak. That sounded cheesy, didn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hopefully that makes sense though, but that's a really good point. Breaks, really, really important. You have to do it. Back when I used to play all the time, you know, all day long, I didn't have any breaks. And, you know, now I look back, I realise it wasn't the, most, it wasn't the healthiest thing to do because I probably created problems at the same time as improving my technique, you know, that I had to undo later on. So my advice is absolutely, you know, that's the right thing to do. Have you ever had RSI? Uh, never, luckily, never. Started weight training recently, the past year, and got a uh, golfer's elbow on the inside of this arm. It's gone now. Basically, I figured out the problem was dumbbells. But in terms of playing, never, never. I've been lucky because a lot of people suffer from, yeah, from that. What do you think caused that? Uh, what you're saying, I'm not really a naturally gifted musician, but I do have a gift that I can concentrate on something and absolutely hammer away at it for hours, and I think just killer tendonitis. I had to put the guitar in the cupboard for six months. Really? Yeah. That, so can, that can, can boils back to what you were saying. 
have a break for physical reasons, not just the approach to practice. Well, interestingly, I've been trying this uh, kind of hybrid stuff in recent weeks. I started getting pain again through here. Just really? Like, just by doing this. That kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I was wondering, um, I know some guys, like I pull off really hard to get really loud notes. Yeah. But some guys say about like you hammer on to the next note, I was wondering if you have a... I have ways of practice, this is a, this is a that's a good question. Uh, I have ways of that I practice legato stuff. Um, when I'm playing, you know, performing and, you know, improvising or whatever, I never do hammer-ons from nowhere, uh, hammer-ons descending, I just don't do it. I do it when I practice. But I spend a lot of time doing. Um, I'm going to change guitars actually. Um, <coughs> I spend a lot of time doing left hand only work. Um, and it's interesting that you've developed pain yeah. in your <laughs> left hand because you shouldn't. Yeah. You know, there's obviously something going on that, that, that shouldn't be there. And I'm going to talk about a technique that you can use to to try and you know eliminate that issue in a minute. Um, but what I do is I I will just practice um, random stuff. I'll just take a scale, scale and just You know, that kind of thing, just try and keep it going. However... So I'm just laughing because that's your random stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's random in the fact that I'm not thinking about, um, uh, you know, the musical aspect. Well, kind of am, you know, because I don't like to play stuff that sounds crap. <laughs> but I'm not making that a priority, you know what I mean? What I'm doing when I'm doing this is I'm looking for that, that sweet spot in the left hand. Um, it takes a long time to be able to develop that, but this is what I do, this is my approach to it. Um, it's got to be the right amount of tension with your left hand. It doesn't make any sense to me to use more tension than is necessary. Mm. If you, mind you, if you look at somebody like Guthrie, Govan, yeah. he, he slams the hell out of it when he pulls off, and it sounds amazing. Um, I don't know whether it's affected his hand or anything like that, but for me, that, uh, that level of tension would probably be too much. And I would probably develop some kind of, you know, issue. Um, for me, I need to get that perfect balance of um, just the right amount of tension. No, no less or no more. Do you mm. know what I mean? One way that I, I develop that is actually from classical guitar technique yet again. I want to show you this. I, you may have come across it, I don't know, but I'll show you it. Let's take this note here. It's a G note on the bottom E string. Now, just play that note, finger it as you would normally, just with your index finger. But what I want you to do is take a mental note of how much pressure you're applying to that note to get the note to sound. So just play it and just feel it. One way as well is just by looking at it, you can see if your finger's turning white, you've got issues. <laughs> white. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. That's the idea, is that you just take a mental note of how much pressure you're applying to the string. Okay, just remember that. Take your hand off now. What we're going to do now is, I'll get a, put it back onto my clean setting. What we do now is, we're going to gradually apply, I mean it's going to be hard for you, you need to be able to do this at home when you get home. Um, but what, what this is doing is actually trying to find the spot which is just the right amount of tension needed to make a good note sound. So what, I'll show you what, what you do. You, you gradually, you just push in, really gradually, until you get a good note. And then compare how much tension that you need to get that good note against the amount of tension you use to get that good note. Do you understand what I mean? That's really helpful. Yeah. Now, what that does is that gives you a snapshot of how much excess tension you are using. When I discovered that, I was like, oh my God. The, you know, that meant that my, everything that I played, I, I was using bags and bags of excess tension that didn't have to be there. 
So that, this really enabled me to, to, to get control of that. So now, when I practice the legato stuff, um, that's what I'm focusing on. So I'll start, I'll, again it's, you know, random stuff. is I'm not shredding it for shredding its sake. What I'm doing is letting the left hand just go on its journey, but I'm focusing on how much tension I'm applying as I'm doing it. And um, I will, if, if I find that sweet spot, I can keep that going <coughs> all day if necessary, you know, because the left hand is using, it's, it's that perfect balance with tension, you know. So for me, this again was a huge eye opener for my technique. You know, so you know, I'm saying before I don't use classical, don't play classical guitar anymore. Um, I still do, but not very often. But it's the, the approaches that I've learned from that way of thinking has changed my electric playing just ridiculously. So does that help? Does that make any sense? You know, so you can use these tools to just assess whether you're. Uh, again, it's a problem-solving thing. If you're struggling to play things, remember what I said to you about this, and then just test it. Just say, well, hang on, how, how much tension am I, am, am I applying to the string? And then that might be the answer to your issue. To be honest, the, the amount of tension that people apply is usually way, way, way too much. So you think, you get rid of that excess tension, you think how comfortable it's going to be, you know? And you want to be able to play continuous lines without any problem, without even thinking about, you know, running out of steam, you know. So you can do it. Anybody can do it. I believe that anybody can do it. I think there's a big thing of, you know, guitar players that, um, that are really, really good technically. I think if anybody puts in the work, you can get there. You've just got to be prepared to approach it intelligently and discipline. Really, really important. So that was a really good question. I can't remember who answered it. Was it you, John? Yeah. Uh, who asked it? Yeah. Another cracking question. I've got loads more than anybody else. Yeah. So I've been thinking about it for months. Yeah. <laughs> I have a, I have a right hand and a left hand question. Sure. Yes. Who me? This place where. Yeah. And um, so the right hand. How are you? I couldn't really see from here. How, how do you? I don't want to get too caught up in technique, but how are you right, no, holding your hand against it? So I find doing a bit of a, I do a bit of a knot for thing most of the time, which is having my little finger there yeah. resting. Sometimes I'm moving to that. Yeah. And um, it, it, have you got sort of anything that you stick to, or is it just or usually? <laughs> well, I I like to to change it. It right. depends what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, so another good question because. There are so many different approaches to right hand position. Mm. Um, one thing recently is I started to get into gypsy jazz guitar playing, right, okay. and that technique is uh, really unusual, but it felt really comfortable for me, just okay. the approach to it. So uh, now I try and use it for various different things, various, usually tonal colours and, and um, those kind of elements. Mm -hmm. But what is it? What position do you find that you're, you're playing normally? Sort of, so when I'm picking um, sort of a piece um, that's normally alternate picking, yeah. um, I'll, be, I'll be hanging on to the bottom. Um, yeah, worker. this is something um, that I, just, that's interesting. It's a, nice place, is, it's a little elevated, but it's just... Interesting <laughs> point, and this is something that I asked myself for years and years. Yeah. You know, I go into these long, you know, in-depth, thoughts about you know technique and everything else but one thing that bugged me and in fact it still does now a little bit if I'm honest <laughs> is whether I should put my pinky on the guitar or not <laughs> you know it's crazy isn't it yeah. but it's I think it's sometimes I do both I do, <laughs> I, do I pick like that but sometimes I'll Time, 
it's to do with the attack on the strings. If I want to tell you... Heavier attack, I'll not... I'll keep my hand floating, right. generally. And that actually is, a, is not just to do with the right hand position, it's to do with the thumb. Yeah. So when I do... Can you see, if you look at my thumb when, I, when, I, when I'm floating, there is a little bit of movement, but not, not that much. But when I put my hand here, there's a lot more movement here. Floating's almost more efficient for you, really. Well, yeah. floating, if I float, it gives me, um, I'm able to, to control the dynamic range of my playing a bit more, mm -hmm. you know. I can still do it with this, mm -hmm. but I get more volume and more attack when I keep the thumb pretty rigid. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what you were saying, are you questioning whether that's the right thing to do or for yourselves? Yeah, sort of, and I wonder if I'm losing some... Efficiency. Maybe it's my way of disciplining my right hand without looking properly at what my right hand's could doing. Be. Probably it <laughs> could be. But at the end of the day, you need to do what's comfortable for you. Yeah, yeah. You know. I just wondered if I was slowing myself down, maybe because sometimes I revert to just having that side of my hand yeah. across the bottom doing that, and I just well, I'm best, slowing myself down. Yeah. Like that. The, the thing to ask yourself is is really a logical question. Does it get in the way of playing? Does it cause any problems for yeah. your playing? You know, if you if you feel that it doesn't cause any issues for your playing, then there's no reason why you should change it. If you feel that it's it's creating an issue and you you, you feel a bit of tension, it doesn't feel that natural to you, then maybe you should assess it. Yeah. But if you're thinking to yourself, because a lot of guitarists have this thing hovering over their head that I shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> you understand what I'm talking that. about, don't you? <laughs> I shouldn't be doing this. A lot of that is somebody was. Uh, I had a lesson with somebody the other day and he was talking about uh, playing this arpeggio. Just a, a straight G major arpeggio and he was like, is that cheating? You know, doing that to get two notes. And I said, well, why would it be cheating? You know, there's this element within guitar players that is like, I shouldn't be doing that because that's wrong. I don't know where that comes from, but... Um, Funnily enough, classical. well, <laughs> one of the best teachers I ever had classically, a guy called David Miller, loop player, um, and he was totally for unconventional fingerings and stuff like that. So any time that um, anybody came in and did, did arpeggios and pieces that had different fingerings, he was like, it really excited him. He was like, wow, that's brilliant, because it's, it's an original approach. And if it doesn't get in the way of the music, that's all that matters. You know, um, so the important thing is that you've got to, the best thing to do is to say to yourself, is it getting in the way of my playing? Is it causing a problem? <coughs> if it is causing a problem, then you might have to, you know, reassess how you position your hand. But, yeah. you know, there are tons of people out there that, that, that do that. You know, I wouldn't wrestle too much too with much. it because it would probably take up a lot, too much of your time. <laughs> I had a similar issue when I was, uh, when I play scales. Not now though, but, um, I didn't know whether I should be with with uh, two tones this shape, whether I should be using one two four or one three four, and for years and years I was, which one's the right one? Which one's the right one? Now I use both and don't mm. think about it. That was my left hand question really. It was oh, sort of around the shapes and the way. You, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you've got to, again. You've got to think logically. Yeah. You know, with fingering choices, there's always going to be pros and cons to yeah. it. One of the most important things is you've got to figure out what works for you because every human being is different. Mm -hmm. Their physical makeup is different. So the left hand is going to be different. So what feels right for you isn't going to be right for Joe Bloggs down the street. You know, he's going to feel better doing something else. Mm -hmm. What you've got to do is find what works for you and justify why, you could, why you're using it. In other words, if it's not creating any problems musically or technique-wise, there's no reason why you shouldn't do it. You know what I mean? Thank you. Hopefully that helps. Any more questions? Talk it like more harmonically. You were doing some like outside lines and phrasing mm. over that e Dorian. Yeah. Uh, what sort of? Do you want me to talk about those? Yeah. What sort of approach? Is it melodic minor or? Yeah. I'll talk you through those. Sort of, yeah. um, basically, is that how is everybody's theory here? You're generally okay. <laughs> no fade with the theory. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> I'll try and keep it as simple as possible and not use too many. Um, theoretical terms. Um, over that, 
I, as I said at the start, I like to do, I like to do static stuff because it gives me yeah. the opportunity to really, really be creative. And I try. The, for me, I'm improvisation is is what I do. You know, um, but the biggest thing about improvising for me is coming up with phrases that sound as though they were preconceived. Phrases and melodies that sound like they were written. So that's that's my goal as a player. Um, so anyway, with that out of the way. When I um, have a backing track like this, the first thing I'll do is figure out what my choices are to play over it. Um, so the first thing is, what would you, what would you guys do? Say uh, I put on this backing track. Say let's just use that same backing track actually. Um, oops. So how can you work out that? Hang on. Right, can I use you as an example? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, first things first, I say to you, right, we're going to jam over this. Or, no, you're going to jam over it. Yeah. So, what are you going to do? I'm not playing it straight off, I'm saying, this is what we're going to jam over. You've got like five minutes to think about it. Yeah. What, what are you going to do? How, what is your thought process? Root movement straight away. Okay. So, here's our backing track. So, I'm showing you the backing track. Yeah. So straight away you can hear it's static. Yeah, it's doesn't move anywhere. As well. Yeah, that's the other thing. Yeah. It's minor. It's got a minor vibe to it. Yeah. You don't have to know exactly what the chord is, but yeah. you can hear straight away. You can assess whether it's major or minor. The tonality of, of the backing track. Um, you've already established that it doesn't go anywhere. It's static. There are no you know no yeah. chord progressions from one to the next in it, which is. Good in one respect, but it's also hard in another because it means you've got to be a lot more creative. So, what scale choices would you use over something like this? Uh, it is Dor it's Dorian, a Dorian backing yeah. track. It's a cool. Dorian backing track. So, I'd use Dorian. Um, maybe some B altered for like a dominant sound. Yeah. To resolve. Uh, Absolutely. Maybe some yeah. E melodic minor stuff. Yeah. That yeah. sort of stuff. That's e the first tonic. As well. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, e blues. My like first port of call is making a list of all my scale options. Um, having said that, I've got to know what the chord is. I've got to know what the chord is. Is it yeah. minor six? It? Well, this one is. Hang on. Yeah, it's a minor six yeah. chord. So you've got that kind of synth yeah. sound, but it's a minor six. So you're getting this it's kind of chord. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's got ninth in there. So these will be the notes. So um, that's the. F Just before we go ahead and, and talk about scales, that would be the first thing that you have to do. Whenever you're presented with a backing track, you've got to know the chords. You've got to know the chords. That's one thing that most players really make a mistake on is, is <coughs> straight for the jugular, straight for the minor pentatonic, and, and playing without knowing what the chords are or how they move. You know, and I think this, this is an area, we'll talk about this in a bit actually, because chord, understanding the fretboard in terms of chords and chord shapes. You, I use the cage yeah, system a lot, exactly. so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I use it with improvising. We'll, take a, we'll do a blues as well and, and we'll, I'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, going, going to this, I would use stuff like melodic minor if I want to go outside. It's dead easy to do. Literally. All you have to do is think about the major seventh. Yeah. So instead of thinking, damn, I have to use, I have to learn a whole new scale, melodic minor, to play over this, just raise the seventh degree. But include it in your Dorian. So, so here's our seventh. Ways that we're, I'm going to talk a little bit now. Do you know uh, about uh, for you guys? Do you know the minor pentatonic? Are you comfortable with that? E minor pentatonic. Can you play me E minor pentatonic? Can you do it from fret 12? That's it. That's it. Now we, I'm just going to.
talk to you about um, playing over this based on the question I've just got to create a slightly different sound. When you play E minor pentatonic, instead of, because uh, one choice we've just talked about is E melodic minor, um, instead of thinking, oh no, I've got to learn a whole new scale, all we have to do is change one note of the minor pentatonic shape. That's it. So, here's our E minor pentatonic. <laughs> So that's our E minor pentatonic. All we're going to do is change the root to a flat and seventh, uh, to, a, to a major seventh, and we get. Sounds amazing. <coughs> what we're doing is changing one note of a scale that we already know. That's it. So you ducks think you could do it. Yeah, well, well you can you can mix you can keep yeah. the root in there if you want. Yeah, yeah so mix I it. I usually in. do it like just Yeah. So, so, <coughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it doesn't matter, you can keep yeah. the root in there, as long as you get the seventh in yeah. there, it doesn't matter. But the reason I'm showing you this is it's really easy to, to, to apply this by using it with something you already know, like the minor pentatonic scale. So even if you took the minor pentatonic scale, you can add the you can add this one. Do you know the blues scale, E blues? Instead of doing this shape here, we're going to do it on the D string. Sounds amazing. So if I just put the backing track on. sound of it actually is move the minor pentatonic scale up a step. Uh, like the side step is yeah. Sounds a little bit predictable like uh, here's an outside yeah. thing and just sounds a little bit predictable. I like to s the stuff that I play to sound a bit more natural sounding. Yeah. You know, Some of the guys do it and do a good job of it but I've never really been, never liked it so much. Um, so melodic minor is one way that you can step out of it, as you were quite rightly said. You can apply, you can apply the five chord, um, uh, B altered. So which melodic minor scale would that give you? Uh, C. C melodic minor. So you can play C melodic minor over yeah. this. Another really good scale is um, E diminished. Oh yeah, yeah. So half whole. Yeah. <laughs> Really great sounding scale, and um, because it's symmetrical, it's a really cool sound. That so though that's it. Those are the sounds that I use all the time. That one, that works really well because you've got one shape. Do tapping ideas like that. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have tried that kind of thing. No. Mm. no I won't dwell too too long yeah, on that yeah, kind of technical yeah. stuff. But 
Um, yeah, those are some of the, the outside kind of things that I use. I just try and keep it simple. The other thing is just chromatics. Yeah. You know, um, just playing chromatic stuff. In, and basically, it's like a Brett Garson approach, filling in the blanks of a scale. You know, and it works great. <laughs> Sounds like you're doing something more than you're actually yeah. doing, you know what I mean? Because you just. Yeah, he does it all the time. Yeah. He does it all the time. It's great. What he says, and he's absolutely right, if you, as long as you land on a good note, you can do whatever the hell you like in between yeah, that. That's it. As long as you, make, you have some kind of melodic and rhythmic. Or you know, as, as long as it makes a bit of yeah. sense, you know, if it's you can't just do random stuff and yeah. hope that it'll work. You know, it's got to make some kind of sense. But um, I use those chromatic stuff all the time. Guthrie does, guys, unbelievable. You know, so <coughs> yeah, that, those are some of the things that I I do use. But it's mainly over a backing track like this. It will be um, yeah. yeah. Sometimes I'll do the pentatonics. You know, you can. Substitute pentatonics uh, and stuff. Scott Henderson sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Like, um, if you think Dorian is chord number two, isn't it? So, but most players would go straight to the root and play that. But you could do, if you think of the key, which key does this come from? If we're in E Dorian, what key would major key? Oh, D, D major. D yeah. major. Yeah. So, if you think of all the minor chords, what which what are the minor chords in that key? Of, of D major. Uh, e minor, minor, short minor, and B minor. B minor, absolutely. All of those chords you can build a minor pentatonic scale on. So you can actually theoretically play B, uh, E minor, F sharp minor, and B minor. I use B minor a lot because it sounds great. So I use that quite a lot, pentatonics, you know, yeah. um, substituting those. Um, so yeah, hopefully that, yeah, that yeah, answers your question. Those, yeah. Diminished scale is worth using because... Yeah, um, that's a good thing, that's for it, but... Yeah, it's good. The, the classic one is the Robin Ford. Yeah, it's a real thing, I've really worked out for it, but... You, the best thing that you, you can do with that... Learning. Thing. Well, what I actually do is I, I play around the dominant seventh chord because that chord, the, the scale, the half hold scale, fits perfectly with. Um, yeah, yeah, Robin Ford yeah. did that. Um, well, chord four in the blues. No, to go to chord four, e, oh, yeah, G. Yeah. On the last bar, Diminished the fourth bar it. of your first um, one seven chord in a blues. Um, but. Over a static thing like this, you can use it all the time to get some outside sounds. Right. And uh, the way I think of that is um, a dominant, dominant chord with just some extra altered notes in there. Which is basically the, the flat nine, sharp nine, and flat five. So anytime I come across anything like this, which is 13 flat nine chord, I will go straight to diminished. Yeah. So, um, but the diminished scale, this scale outlines a G dominant seventh chord. So what I tend to do is add in those extra. Uh, yeah. So the flat nine, sharp nine, those because they are the extra notes that make it sound diminished. So that's what I tend to do. Yeah. But I'll, I'll also take the. Um, I'll put this on. I'll take the shape. So I find the tonic. Outside sound really easily. Do you have the major third? The major yeah. third is there yeah, because yeah. of the nature of this. It actually, the way I think of it, uh, the way a lot of jazz players think of it as well is this is the major third, you've got a minor third there as well, 
It sounds like a minor third, but you treat it as a sharp nine instead. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Mm. So you get that. <laughs> Shape, which is really useful. Uh, that shape is great, you can just move it around and yeah. it sounds cool. The diminished shape. But yeah, diminished is one I use yeah. quite a lot. Depends how outside I want to go. Yeah. These days I, I love just playing straight ahead rock, yeah. shred stuff. So. Stay fairly inside. Yeah. yeah, most of the time. Right, I'm going to, I've talked about um, static playing now. I'm just going to play, improvise over a blues backing track, and then, again, take questions, but I'm going to talk a little bit about my approach to playing over this kind of progression, how I approach it, what I think about, and hopefully you guys will have a go at it as well. Hopefully. <laughs> so let's, let's get on. I'm just going to do like a slow blues backing track. Um, again, I'm going to try and uh, build motifs. Uh, but hopefully make it as tasty as possible. Let me just get the sound going. <laughs>
Right, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about how I approach it, um, how I approach playing over this kind of progression. Um, first things first, like I was saying before, you've got to know the chords. So who can tell me the chords? One, four, five. Yeah, in which key? G. G. I see, so what would they be? G, uh, C7 and D7. Good, excellent. So let's just take a G chord. Um, Open G, play me open G. Right. First things first, we've got to be able to play this chord in every possible position on the fretboard. So, where would the next available shape be for G? Good, so it's an E major shape. Good, excellent. What about the next available position? Good, excellent. Yeah, it's a D shape. It's a D shape. So from here. That's it. So you want your root on the fourth string, that's it. It's a bit of a pain that shape. It is. They can just substitute the fifth. Yeah. 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 So next chord shape after that. Are you following? That's it, C major. Good. Anybody stuck with this? Right, I'll explain it in a minute. Uh, and then the last chord shape, what would the last chord shape be? That's it. So basically, G major scale, the G major chord all the way up the fretboard would look like this. Slightly out of tune at the top. But that's how it should be. As a player and an improviser, you need to know this back to front. You've got to know it. It's very, very, very important. A lot of players will only be able to just play a couple of shapes, you know, maybe with a little bit of thinking, <coughs> find those other shapes. But you need to be able to do it, bang, like that. It's very much like the way that you learn scale shapes. You need to approach chords in the same way. Uh, the reason so, the reason why is because, well, it's obvious, we need to know the fretboard. And we also need to know how the chords relate to the scales. So when we've got a track like this, instead of thinking um, chords 1, 4 and 5, what I will do is start with chord number 1 and make sure I know every single position on the fretboard. And we're just dealing with triads here. We haven't talked about any of the chord types, you know, because you can extend those chords and get various different chord types. But you start with the triad because it's the foundation with which you build your knowledge of the fretboard. So I'm just going to explain a little bit about this. Um, five open major chord shapes. These ones I'm going to play now are really important. C. A. G. E. And D. Okay, those five in that particular order. They spell the word caged. C-A-G-E-D. The reason why those are important are because those are the shapes that we use to play one particular major chord all the way up the fretboard. So if we look at our G chord, if you think of the word caged, they're the shapes that we use. Okay? So that's a C shape, that's an A shape, that's a G shape and so on. So, we're working out G major. So, what shape is that? E. That's it. So, where is that in the word caged? In other words, what comes after that? D. D. So that gives us our next chord shape. That's the nearest available chord shape that we need to play a G major chord in the next position. All we do is take this root, move it up, and there we have it, D shape. That's a G major chord still, but we're using the D major shape. Okay, does that make sense? So, we've had G and D in the word caged. What letter comes next? C. We start the whole thing again. So if you look at that, here's our next chord shape for G. That's the C shape. It looks the same as that, doesn't it? Can you see how that's the same? So we've got three chords, there are, there are no gaps on the fretboard, but three chords that give us that, the, the G major chord. What's the next? A. A. If we change the root, this is our A chord. 
this is really, really important. After that, it's the G shape here. Um, this is really important because as an improviser, you need to know what those shapes are. Why, are that, why is it really important to know that? If you're, an imp if you're thinking about improvisation and soloing, why is it important that we need to know where the chords are? So you're afraid of the choice. They're absolutely right. To be more specific, identify chord tones. Chord tones, absolutely. So if you know where every single chord is on the fretboard, you're going to be able to find those chord tones. And why do we need the chord tones? Because those chord tones, tones will sound really good against the chord in the background. So if I play these notes, if I just take a G7 arpeggio, dominant seven, you can hear the, the chord without anybody else playing the chord. So as a soloist, you should be able to improvise, and even without a backing track, hear a chord. Um, so wherever you are on the fretboard, if, I, if I'm playing over the G chord, I need to be able to feel comfortable. <laughs> Those are all based, I wasn't playing scale shapes, I was thinking about the chords, the chords and playing around the chord. I'll get it in tune. So let's say I'm in this position here, and the chord in the background is G, that's essential that you need to know what's happening in the background. So I'll play that shape, but I'm thinking of the D shape. Am I making sense here? See it? So... Now I've moved into positions, which, what's our nearest chord shape here? So then I, I'm, I'm, I'm changing the way I'm thinking when I'm soloing. So what happens if I move to here? If I'm in this area of the fretboard, which chord shape am I going to be thinking about? So. Exactly. So, it's still a G7 chord. Notice I'm adding some extra notes in there as well. Just make it sound a little bit more interesting. Instead of just playing the arpeggio. <coughs> And the same with the next position, A shape. <laughs> so again, I'm playing around the chord. I'm not. I'm actually not thinking about scale shapes when I'm doing this. I'm thinking about the chord and how it changes. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if we play over a blues, we've got to do this with every single chord. So what we're going to do is we need, to, we need to know chords 1, 4 and 5 in every single one of those five positions. So, let's say we're in this position. Here's our G7 chord. So, we want to go to C7. We want to try and minimise the movement with our left hand. In other words, we don't want to be jumping all over the fretboard. Uh, a lot of players do that, and then play a shake up there. That's okay, but you don't want to be moving. You want to know, be able to change chords without moving your left hand. So, you've got two choices here. You've got this one, but that's too much of a movement. A shape is the one we need. That's it. What about the D chord, D7? Exactly, that's the shape. So, when we're in this position, G7. Over the C, over the D. Okay, so those three chords, simple enough. Let's move up to the next available G chord shape. So where's that? There. So that here's G. So what chord comes next? C7. So where's that? Where's the nearest shape without having to move? There we go, that's it. Can you hear just in that? You've got the change there, just in those two chords. Good. So you want to be going. So 
changes from. So, uh, yeah, it's just one note difference. Uh, D7, what's the D7 chord shape? That's it. So you want to be doing this. That's it. So, good. That's that's the next position. What about the next position? What's the next G shape? That's it. You know where I'm going with this. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is you've got to... Assess in order to be able to play over and improvise over something, you've got to be able to take the chords and play them in every single position. Um, this is what a lot of guitarists don't do. They'll just stick with one scale, one position. They'll probably do this. It can sound great, but you've got all this area of the fretboard that you haven't covered, especially with the chord shapes. Um, that's it. That's a great thing to do. Do them as three note chords and move them up. That was my first lesson in college, just working out the four inversions on the top four yeah. strings for everything. Really Except useful. Four. Really yeah. useful. Um, so the, what I'm trying to get at here is that knowing the fretboard is a lot more than just playing scale shapes. In fact, scale shapes are just a part of it. You've got to be able to play the chords all over the fretboard. Um, once you've learned those basic five shapes, because you don't have to do them like that, you could do um, the, the major chords, as you've said, in different inversions across, say, groups of three or four strings, really useful. Um, <coughs> but it's important to do this, because that will give you a foundation upon which to build and extend the chords, the chord type. So just as an example, um, Let's take a C major chord. We're going to play C major in every pos in every position, like we did with all the others. <coughs> C, A, G, E, D, all the way up. Are you okay with that? Does, if you have to think about it, you can do it. You can you know yeah. work on it yeah. in your own time. You know this is fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is everyone okay with this or anybody having trouble understanding it? <laughs> Just the bit there. <laughs> that for most people, you know why is it that everybody plays chords like that or like that? You know, it's either root on the, the sixth or the fifth. Okay, Very maybe. rarely do you see people been getting away with it for years. <laughs> so, but it, this is an area, it covers that big gap that most players have, you know, in terms of fretboard knowledge. So this is a great way of doing it. But I'll show you how you can start using these, these triads for something a bit more interesting. Um, well, to, to, to extend your chord knowledge. Um, so, I've just said play the C chord. What we're going to do is we're going to change that chord. We're going to extend it by adding a seventh degree, a major seventh degree to that chord. And we're going to do that with every single shape that we play ascending to get an e, a, a C major seven chord across the fretboard. So again, most guitarists, when they, they learn shapes, they'll go C major seven, C major seven, uh, gaps here. You know, you don't want any gaps on the fretboard. So, C major, play me a C major chord. Just play this regular C major. That's it. Nice chord that was. Yeah. Um, that's it. Now take your first finger off. C major seven, dead easy. What's the next shape as a C major triad? That's it. But go straight to your major chord, then add the major seven. In this instance, it's this. shape of C major 7, but notice we're basing it on the major shape. What we're doing is changing one note. That's it. Good, so C major 7. What's our next shape in the sequence? C, A, G. So how are we going to play that chord as a major 7? There you go. All we need to do is that. And there we've got that G chord. A lot of the time, it's, it's useful uh, 
playing situations, you just get rid of the root, you're not going to need it. Some of you guys might recognise this if we change the bass note as an A minor 9. So, that's, um, that's based on the G shape. On that, all we're doing is adding the major 7th to it. What comes after G? E. So our major 7th is here on the 4th string. So we have to change the chord slightly and we end up with that. That's it. And then finally, what comes after that? The D chord. Got it. So the idea is that you're using something really simple, the cage system of those five major chords, and you can change or add notes to it and you can play any chord you want based on that sequence of five chords. It should unlock the fretboard for you. If you practice it in the right way, it should give you lots of different options. So C major seven. Not just for playing the chords as I've done, being able to visualize the shape. Because when you go back to soloing, uh, whoops. You should be able to. Oh shit, C major 7. You know, I'm constantly thinking there of the chord shape that I'm positioned up in. Understanding of how maybe you can approach unlocking the fretboard. Uh, it's really important not just for your chord knowledge but for soloing as well. Um, you've got to be able to have access to those chord tones. Who wants to have a go at playing over this blues track? Have a go. You want to just plug, use this, plug in. This is probably going to be the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. Maybe it's great that you've just gone for it. <laughs> Okay, so just to recap, just G blues. <coughs> Go for it.
slightly different now. We're going to take the same progression, but what we're going to do is play. You guys are happy to play again? Yeah. yeah? What we're going to do is, is make it uh, limit ourselves a bit now. What I want you to do is play um, quarter notes only and chord tones only. Okay. So don't worry about phrasing or vibrato or anything else. Just make sure you, if you can, um, get good voice leading. So rather than doing any jumping around from, from notes like that, um, I'll, just, I'll give you an idea of what I mean. to get you to where you need to be. Yeah? yeah cool. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> oh dear. Um, stay in the same position, don't worry about moving cool. positions. Okay. I'll take it back. Three. So only using chord Cor tones? Only chord tones, yeah. Guys, you know, really advanced shredders that, that fall to pieces with doing this kind of thing. I was, I was pretty nervous. <laughs> yeah, you did really well, man. You did really well. I you know. I, go? I know. I feel. <laughs> <laughs> that was really good. But the idea behind this is that you have to really start thinking about where you are, chord shapes, intervals against the chord, rather than any kind of muscle memory. Muscle memory is great up to a point. And the idea is to be able to mix the two. So whenever you want to put a little flashy, faster line in or anything like that, you, you're able to balance it then with being able to control what you play. Maybe? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Quarter note 
How did you feel about that? Um, what? Any thoughts? It's really hard. To it's very hard to that degree. It's very hard, and you know, both of you guys have done great. So give them a clap. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the reason it's hard is because it exposes your knowledge of, of the chord tones. So, being able to just go, here's a chord, yeah I know that chord, do you really know it well enough to be able to, to, to play through this and make a melodic line and make it make sense as well. Um, so it takes practice, you know, and as well we've just done it in this position. We need to be able to move to the next position and do the same thing and the next, and the next. You know, with that, as the chord changes, stay in that position. Um, so it highlights a number of things. The reason it's difficult is because you're limited with your rhythmic playing, and you're not, it's not muscle memory. The other thing is, when you do this, you will do exactly the same thing, and both of you do it. I did it at the start there, because I wanted to introduce you to how it works, but everybody does the same thing. What they'll do is this when they start it. They go to just play a G7 arpeggio. We don't have to do it, you can start from anywhere. Yeah. Okay? But what you'll find that will happen is that you'll repeat the same lines again. So you've got then got to say, hang on. Yeah. Because you'll end up doing And what is that? It's like, a, it's like a bass line, isn't it? A lot of this is like bass playing. You know, because you're highlighting the chords, that's what a bass player's job is. Yeah. Was it you that was saying you're a bass player? Oh, it was you, you're a bass player. So you know all yeah. about that. You know, your job is to highlight the chords, not play, you know, a flashy guitarist lick. So this is where it really separates the guys who are just reliant upon muscle memory, which is a good thing, I'm not knocking that at all. But this will really help you grow as a player in terms of understanding the fretboard, understanding or being able to control time, feel and rhythm, you know, because limiting yourself to just quarter notes, that's damn hard, you know, but you should be able to do it. You're a musician, this should be part of what you work on. Um, if you want to make start making it more interesting, that's where you put in the neighbour tones, the passing tones, and uh, inferring certain chords, yeah. you know. So, if I, these kind of sounds where you go from flat nine of the G to five of the, the four chord. So you've got to know where, you've got to be thinking about this the whole time. So if you hit a note, you've got to be able to resolve it. You know, it's all about good voice leading. That's what makes a good line, is, is being able to voice lead. But it takes practice, you know. Um, it takes me a while to warm into this. Once I've practiced it a little bit, then it... You know, it starts to flow a hell of a lot better. So, um, but anybody else want to try this? Yeah, yeah come on. Are you going to have a go? Yeah. Yes, <coughs> brilliant. Unless anybody else wants to. Um, it's your event. Oh, no. <laughs> it's all you. No, I can't. David? No, I'm not <laughs> Do you want that or do you want this? No, 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 this will be all right. Do you want to use mixed, John? I'll let you hold on to that for another day. A lot of people have sold the sir, Tom got rid of his. Yeah. Five of my college has got it. As <laughs> yeah. if. Yeah. I was playing it the other day. No, Luke's guitar was nice. I've got like, um, like, like, like SGs and. Yeah. Um, yeah, sir. And it's like, it's very, it's very much like that, you know, like the, yeah. just the, the whole kind of. Sir, Tom. Really, yeah. But I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, not for this, this afternoon. I was there, I was not blues. I've got, I know, I know. I've got a surface sale if anybody wants one. Nice. 
Snow 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 Mine's a Swamp Rash Chain body. Oh. The Bird's Eye Maple Mac. That sounds like it. What is that guitar anyway? It's just a custom built. I made it out of warm off parts for you to warm off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, if you want, get what you want, you may as well make it go. <laughs> yeah, too right. You make me on amps as well. Really? I've always wanted to do that. It's easy, man. You should get it. You can get tube amp kits. You can get tube amp kits, can't you? Yeah, I bought my first kit. Yeah, yeah, I've got two of them. Yeah, man. I'll tell you details later. I'll do it. 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 Absolutely. How far can you restrict yourself? Absolutely. Stop, stop Lots of things sound. that you can apply to this, yeah. and that's another thing I was going to talk about, is thinking about the intervals that you're on and how they resolve from chord to chord. <coughs> you take each one, each one of these, so you've got four notes there, how does, it result, how does each note change when you go to, from the one chord to the four chord? So what does, this is the root of the G, third of the G, fifth, flat seventh. What does this note become when it goes to the four chord? That's it. What happens to this? What's got to happen to this note? Well, there are two options, aren't there? Yeah, yeah, you can raise it. What does that become? The root. So if you flatten it, what does it become? Flat seven. Against the G, what's that? Fifth against the C. Second. Okay. Now, interesting one. This when you've got a note that resolves a tone either side. 
it's a bit more challenging because it doesn't usually when you get notes which are a semitone away you get better voice yeah. leading going from one to the next if you've got a note like this it's a bit more challenging um, it still works but if you're aware of it you know you can make conscious decisions on what you choose to do phrasing wise you know um, so there's lots of ways that you can think about that um, notes which are really useful are ones that don't change you know, so that you can stay on that note yeah. and it, that becomes really effective when you make the change from one to the next. So, loads of different directions you can take this exercise, you don't have to just stick with this. Um, the important thing is that you start thinking about this um, and apply what we talked about with the chords to this, to, to a blues. For me, blues is like the basis of, of improvisation. Um, I've been playing blues for a long, long time. In, I mean, the, the actual progression itself and soloing and improvising over it. And there's always something new to learn with it. Um, I think it's the best, one of the best ways that you can develop your, your knowledge, fretboard knowledge and you just, your general playing. Um, so, I think we should do some more playing, but I think we should do... It's probably about half an hour. Half an hour. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit more about improvising now, but what I'm going to talk about <coughs> is developing ideas when you improvise. So hopefully we'll get some of the guys to try and play now, if you're up for it. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on that backing again, the first backing, but what, uh, what we're going to do is try and build an improvisation based on what we've played previously. So what I like to try and do is build rhythmic ideas. It means that you've got to be aware of what you play the whole time. Um, so, let's put this backing on again. Probably got another one. There's loads of them somewhere, but I'll just stick with this one. So, it's a Dorian thing. It's really easy when you improvise to get carried away with stuff, but what I like to do is start, start with a simple idea. And I'm just going to try something like this. So, that rhythmic phrase. trying to do is think of what I was playing and if I liked what I played continue down that line what that means is you've got to be a thousand percent aware of what it is that you play because you need to be able to control it and continue it it's a bit like having a conversation with somebody when you have a conversation it's all related the subject matter is related you can't jump from one thing to the next and that's what a lot of players do they just do finger movements and Phrasing wise, it doesn't really make any sense, you know. When you phrase, I think it's really important to make sense with the phrases that you play. And one way that you can do that is by taking a, something really simple, a rhythmic motif, <coughs> and developing that. So that's what we're going to do now. Um, anybody want to? Any of you guys, if you're, you feel you want another go? No, Nobody else no, want another one? No, no, no one else. Yeah? yeah? Okay. So what we're going to do, in fact, I'll show you the motif. Um, I've got to think of one there. In fact, let's do the one I just did. And we'll, we'll keep it like, this is, this is your motif. That's it. Now, you can do whatever you want with that. You can develop it, you can stretch it, you can use a... Which is a part of it, isn't it? Take it 
any way that you want, but you've got to try not to go off on a, on a tangent yeah, here okay. and lose track of, of what we're trying to achieve with this. Um, so just get yourself familiar with that phrase. Du -du -du -du. Above all, make it, try and make it as tasty as you possibly can. Just think about what you're playing. What I usually do is I imagine or I let my ear tell me what to play next. Yeah. Um, most of the time I'm able to actually play it, but sometimes, you know, it doesn't quite happen. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether you slip up, make mistakes, that, that means nothing. The important thing is that you just try and develop that motif. Okay. <clears throat> Just to get it in your mind. That's it. Stop there. Stop there. Stop there one second. The easy thing to do is totally sounded good, yeah. but it started to sort of lose direction. Okay. Best way to do it is to, to restrict yourself to that motif and keep it short and simple. Try not to, to wander off down a yeah. different road. So try it again, but just play that motif and just start adding things to it either play side. It. So da 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 something, yeah, yeah, something okay. as simple yeah. as that. And then take that, if you have to repeat it, repeat it. So let's go again. It does. You have to improvise. Yeah. You know the best thing that, that you project. can do? Best thing that you can do is sing a phrase before you play it. Yeah. I'll show you what I mean. Uh, and you don't have to be a good singer, as long as you can roughly get the phrase. So what I'll do is, this is a big thing in my practice, I do this all the time. Um, so, right, I'll just think of... Uh, <laughs> I've got to get the picture on. Ninth flat seven roof. Thank <laughs> you. 
Again, that's quite hard. Yeah. Because it's really easy to go back. Do you want to try? Oh, yeah. There you go. It's quite. E it's really easy to go back yeah. to your comfort zone. I'm gonna try. Just not to play. And you won't be prepared. It's really, it's really hard. But what you've yeah. got to do is you've got to force this to do, yeah, you do to create the music. Hearing things you want to come out. Yeah. And even if you just get the, ry the rhythm from what you hear, it's kind of more effective than just. It is. Playing. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Whatever it is. It is. And it's really important to come back <coughs> to, to what you've done. But what you'll do, what will happen is you'll play the same <coughs> motif. So you've got to start creating interest with that motif by changing the rhythm slightly, or just changing the note arrangement slightly. We're still talking three notes. Just da, da, da. Yeah. But you, all you need to do is just tweak it a little bit. And it yeah. sounds completely different. So, but that was good. Well done. You ready for it? Same thing. And again, this is nobody cares about mistakes or anything like that. It's just trying it is the most important. Yeah. Thing. sense to you in you know how you can start developing your ideas you know you don't have to be the best player in the world to do this you know you can have you know minimum technique but still apply this to your improvising you know it's really uh, you know I do it all the time it's really really useful but what, you, what it forces you to do is start thinking about music rather than just relying on these so it goes back to you know at the start of the, the this class I, I talked about how important muscle memory is but at the same time, you've got to be able to let go of that because that you can't use it as a crutch because that's it's a useful thing, but you can't use it as just one element. <coughs> this is important as well, so you've got to use them both together. What I like to do is do a nice balance of both. So I'm thinking about um, developing the motif, but when you know when I need to, just put in 
some muscle memory stuff, you know. You don't think about each note individually, you just let it happen. So, right, I'm just going to um, put it on and I'm just going to try it. And I think then we'll, that'll probably wrap it up. Ten it? minutes. Oh, ten minutes. the whole time, try things out, try things out, sometimes you really balls it up, but it doesn't matter, the fact is that you've tried it, you know, that's the most important thing, because it can open up lots of new doors, so don't worry about mistakes and, and things when you improvise, just try new things, and try, you know, a healthy balance of thinking about muscle memory and concentrating on playing good phrases. Um, any questions before we wrap up? Do you think you could do a quick example of uh, of the one four five chord progression of that same kind of that, that motif? What, as a, a yeah, of the blues. Yeah, yeah, please. I'll I'll try a different thing instead of using that same motif. Um, I'll just try and try and take a rhythmic motif and try it over. That. The blues is a tricky one, isn't it? Because you, you can get stuck in a rut, but at the same time, there's a way to have that theme without. Exactly. Well, I'm guessing there is. <laughs> well, the, thing to do, the thing to do is keep it as simple as possible. Yeah. So, uh, well... 
And again, it boils down to using your mind to try and concentrate on a phrase. <laughs> this try and avoid using progressions to start with because mm -hmm. you've got to work into that uh, it's hard enough doing it on just one chord never yeah. mind you know through progressions but you, you still have to be able to do it and be aware of it and control it mm -hmm. so thank you oh, great, thank pleasure you. I think we're out of time John no problem good. Uh, I just want to wrap up by saying thank you so much for coming to this I really do appreciate you know, you. everybody coming I've had a great time there's loads more stuff I'd love to talk about and loads more playing I'd love to do, but we are out of time. Save it for next time. Yeah, next time. Thanks a lot, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you.